hello again. Welcome, everyone. My name is Olka Joshi Hansen. I'm Chief Program Officer at Grantmakers for Education. And on behalf of our Executive Director, Celine Coggins, and other members of our team who are here, I want to welcome you and say thank you for spending part of your afternoon with us. Um, we are here for the third in our series on the future of education. We had two sessions already, um, which you can find in the archives on our website. The first was focused on why we need to reimagine education. The second dug into the goals and scope of the pre-K through 12 curriculum. And today we're gonna to be talking about rebuilding the architecture of teaching and learning. And with that, I wanna hand it off to our moderator for the panel, Josh Starr, who's the Chief Executive Officer of PDK International. Thanks, Josh. It's great to see everyone. And it is a really a pleasure to be here. And I'm, I'm glad to be joining you all again to have what I think are really important conversations. Um, today, I'm really thrilled that we are talking about my, my favorite thing, which is teaching and learning, which is the core of um, what, what we do. We have some great panelists who we will be introducing in a moment. And as always, um, what I love about these conversations, the partnership here is that we are sitting in the messy middle between the theories that the theories of action that many um, philanthropists and supporters and investors have about what we want to be doing, what we wish we could be doing, what we hope we could be doing. Then there's the research on what actually works. And, and, and then there's the reality of the practice and what it looks like um, in day to day. And, it's, and I appreciate these conversations because it's an opportunity to ask all the right questions about that middle. Um, as I always like to say, we're not necessarily going to come up with all the answers. And that's why we started this series in partnership with Spencer to, to put all the questions on the table and to get really smart people around that table to put them out there. And so that um, those who continue to support and invest in um, and advocate for stronger public education um, can keep asking all the right questions about the work. So um, I, I very much appreciate that today. We're gonna be focused on um, what the future of teaching and learning should look like over the next 25 years with some fabulous panelists that I know we're gonna be introduced in a moment. Um, and we will go from there. So at that, um, I want to, we're actually going to do it a little bit different these days. I'm going to first, you can see the panelists that we have before us. I think everyone can see that we have joining us today, uh, Gwen Hughes from the Mott Foundation. We have Mary Helen and Morduna Yang from USC. Um, we have John Maida from Harvard. And we have Saskia Levy-Thompson from the Carnegie Corporation. And we're going to start a little differently this time. Um, Jal is actually going to present because we used his piece. Um, he's going to present just a little bit with, and he actually has a slide that he's going to share about what um, sort of the new grammar schooling could look like. Um, and then uh, I'm going to try to get people involved in some good questions uh, and discussion. And then as always, please put in the Q&A of the chat um, questions that we have in the audience so that um, we can then respond to them as we go. So, John Mayer, take it away. Thanks, Josh. Uh, so great to be here. So great to be with the panelists. And uh, I recognize some of the participants. So great to see uh, those of you that I know and to meet those of you who I don't know. Um, so the occasion for this is that the Spencer Foundation asked um, me and some other folks to write about uh, future directions for schooling. And I chose to use this idea from uh, David Tyack and Larry Cuban, The Grammar of Schooling, which I suspect uh, a number of you are, are familiar with. Essentially, the idea is that there's uh, some categories of school that are so familiar that uh, we don't challenge them. Uh, and so those might be things like dividing students up by age, dividing subjects by math, English, history, science, uh, leveling and tracking, uh, 25 kids to a class, and uh, Tyek and Cuban's point is that all of those things are just human conventions. Those are decisions that uh, people made roughly a century ago about how to organize schools, but they're just one set of decisions. So if you think about you know, Montessori school, for example, you have multi-age classrooms. If you think about um, a project-based school, you might have an interdisciplinary curriculum, et cetera, et cetera. So that essentially we've been bequeathed a variety of these categories, but the question is, like, is the form that we've been given really well suited uh, to what we're trying to accomplish? And I think what really motivates me is I think the answer to that question is no. 
um, uh, I'll tell you a very brief story. Um, when my son Alex was in first grade, he came home and he said, you know, uh, Russell is, a, is an R and I am an L. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, reading levels, like Russell's an R and I'm an L. And I was like, at, at best, you could say that like right now, Russell is reading at an R level and you are reading at an L level. And he was like, nope, Russell's an R and I'm an L. And I said, yeah. And he said, and you know what? They tell us that like where you are in the alphabet doesn't matter, but that's just so that kids earlier in the alphabet don't feel bad about themselves. So like the, the first graders have sort of penetrated uh, the, the structure that we've created for them. And, you know, people have observed this before, but kids start as young, curious people. And by sixth or seventh grade, you know, the number one school word they'll associate with learning in school is, uh, is boring. Um, when Seraphine and I were doing our research for our book on In Search of Deeper Learning, where we spent about 10 years in 30 schools, um, one of the things that really struck us was um, the students were saying to us, we would love school to be a lot more lively, interesting, engaging, challenging, authentic, relevant place that connected to us. And the teachers were saying to us, I would love it if my students weren't, you know, grade grubbing and asking like what they needed to do to get this point or that point. Uh, I got into this because I wanted to form relationships with students, which I don't have time to do and to get students authentically excited about subject matter, which I can't do because all they care about is grades. So it seemed like uh, essentially that the structure that both parties had been given wasn't really serving uh, either. Um, and so just to share um, a slide briefly. Um, so for the piece I organized around this uh, changing grammar of schooling and so, in the rows, you can see the various dimensions and we could add to these dimensions. Um, so uh, it really starts with the purpose, like what are we trying to do here? And I think a lot of the way that we currently think about the purpose is sort of assimilating students into the social order. Uh, and I think we could think about the purpose as giving students agency and helping them find purpose in their learning and their lives. Uh, and then potentially enable them to do things like solve big problems like climate change and global poverty and infectious disease and all the things that are gonna wipe us out if we don't figure out uh, how to deal with them. And then that, if, if we change the purpose, then a whole bunch of things would go, would change. So then the, the pedagogical goals would change from uh, covering material. Really, I think one of the biggest problems, at least in American education is just the rush. Like we're just trying to get through this and then this and then this and then this. And if I gave you a quiz today on like mitochondria and Newton's laws and the French Indian war and all those things that you pass tests on in school, like you wouldn't do that well on that quiz, most of us. Uh, and so what if we created a, a grammar where we engage students in using uh, and creating knowledge as producers? What if we change the ethos from tra transactional to relational? What if we stop seeing knowledge as siloed into these buckets and started seeing knowledge as it actually is, which is a huge dynamic interconnected uh, web? What if we made the boundaries between disciplines more permeable and less strong? What if we made the learning more learning by doing than teaching as transmission? What if we gave students more choice? What if, what if there were longer and more variable blocks like, why does everything have to be the same length? Like, sometimes you can learn something in a couple of weeks, sometimes you need a semester, sometimes you need a year. Like, it really should depend on what the, the learning objective is. What if we moved out from classrooms into the whole variety of spaces where people can learn? What if we assessed people less on uh, standardized tests and more on the creation of worthy products in these different domains? Uh, what if we grouped students less in segmented ways and more in integrated ways? What if we thought about equity less as closing gaps on state tests and more as understanding, knowing, and loving each student and thinking about what they would need uh, to reach their potential? What if we moved from schools to thinking about the whole variety of places where people uh, could learn? Uh, a school in Oakland I like, Latitude High, says that like the Bay Area is their classroom. So like, what if we took more of that uh, ethos and then at an organizational level, like what if we didn't make it all so Newtonian, linear, top down, and instead uh, created much more space for distributed leadership? 
uh, an emergent change. All right. So uh, I think I've given the other panelists some uh, jumping off points. So why don't I stop there and yeah, the discussion. So, so I think I actually want to bring, go back to the very top of that chart and, and ra first raise the question of the, because many of the strategies you describe, the teaching and learning strategies are, are great, right? But you posit that the purpose of school should be to remake the social order. Um, and in fact, I think that might be a somewhat contentious, right? Um, and we're actually seeing that right now in states that are kind of clamping down on that because they don't want kids to be thinking. Um, so I think I, I would love to hear what what people, how how other panelists think about that idea of that purpose. Should should schools be remaking the social order, or as government funded institutions, should they simply be reinforcing and perpetuating? The chosen, chosen social and economic order. And I'm not going to call on any of you. I'm going to see whoever wants to jump in on that question. Um, and since Gwen's, Gwen's shaking her head first, I'm going to say, why don't you go first, actually, and we'll call. Uh, what, what, should, sure. should public schools be remaking the social order? So, you know, it's it's such a great group here. And uh, Jal's piece is, is so thought provoking. And so, you know, for our foundation, just to start off, um, we've had the opportunity to work um, to support schools and educators um, since the early 1920s. Uh, and so can appreciate uh, this conversation of how far we've come and how far we have yet to go. And I think it's important in sort of saying, uh, really communicating to su support to all of our educators right now, um, given what they have been through and, and what we're asking of them. Um, both in schools and out of school. I think what we have learned through these years of supporting community schools and now in the past two decades, really supporting this whole after school sector is, you know, schools should be places where uh, children are supported to realize themselves and participate in community. So I think some of the lessons that we have taken over the years is to really look at, you know, and with after school, there's kind of this famous piece, especially for older kids, right? It really um, highlights a lot of the pieces that Jal, uh, a lot of the attributes that Jal calls out because kids can vote with their feet once they get older. Um, it is built around choice, um, really inspiring students to, you know, follow their interests um, to have that sense of agency, to participate increasingly, I think we're seeing in leadership. Uh, so, you know, I do think asking that question, uh, Josh, is a good one, but I would also put out there that what if we start with what kids need and what families need and what kind of future we want to have? Because schools are a way just to you know be a little provoking here josh um schools should be a vehicle to help us get there right as after school in all of our different learning environments so how do we structure across the board uh, i think those are some of the questions we would we would kind of put out there from what we're learning what we're seeing in these different kinds of learning structures learning environments where admittedly you haven't, we haven't had the kind of, um, you know, testing and pieces and restrictions that schools have had. And that's where I think it's interesting to really look at what are the innovations that are occurring in these spaces and what can we learn from them for, for answering your question. Yeah, and, and you kind of teed it up perfectly to Mary Helen, because I know you have some real thoughts about how kids experience school and how that doesn't address the their sort of whole needs that Gwyn was talking about. So why don't you talk about that a little bit, Mary Helen, and then- Yeah, no, yeah, to... that's right. I'm right, you know, right on. Yeah. I, I think I'm gonna start by offering a, another anecdote of my first grader. <laughs> when, when, you know, my, my son is now almost 17, when he, was, when he was in first grade about two weeks into the year, um, it was like a Sunday night. It was the first time he'd gone to school all day, right? He'd, kindergarten was half day and stuff. It was, about, it was a Sunday night 
and I'm putting him to sleep for school the next morning and he's just crying. I don't want to go to school tomorrow. I don't want to go to school. And I'm thinking, is he being bullied? Is something going on? Like, why does he not like school? So I just finally, I really come down and talk to him. It, it finally, he said to me, I just have so much work to do. How do you expect me to get my work done if I'm sitting in school all day? Right? I mean, kids are experiencing the work of school as being separate from their work as people, you know? And they're, you know, this kid was in all manner of engineering things, right? And he was building stuff all over the yard and he felt like school was interfering with that. At one point we have a conversation with him about why do I need to learn to read? I want to design airplanes. <laughs> and we had to pull books off the shelf and say like, look, people who design airplanes write about it. If you want to read it, you're going to have to learn. And then he was like, oh, why didn't nobody tell me this, right? So, I mean, I think we need to think, like one was saying and like Joel was saying about the ways that young people and teachers in school settings experience the learning process. What does it feel like to think? And in the brain too, we're finding that, you know, this kind of false dichotomy between cognitions and academic skills and disciplinary ways of knowing and thinking about stuff on the one hand, and the experience of being yourself, the neural systems that manage your consciousness in the most basic sense are actually not separate. They are repurposing each other in this kind of iterative way where the feeling of being engaged with thinking about something that you know, seems powerful, that affords insight to you personally, is actually modulating the activity, upregulating the activity of your own consciousness, of your own sort of physiological regulatory capacity in your own body. And, and what we're also finding is that teachers' abilities to up and down regulate these physiological capacities in developmental contexts, and that's key, it's in that context, not in general, they, they develop these specialized skills in those contexts, that determines, right, partly statistically predicts unique variants in how students experience the classroom as at once challenging and caring, right? So I think we really need to step back and think, yes, about the dismantling of structures that, as Jal so clearly explained, are probably not supportive or conducive to the kinds of aims that we need our schools to accomplish at, you know, in the 21st century. And we need to also get back to first principles and use our latest science, our latest research, our latest community knowledge, the ways people engage with each other to try to derive together new understandings of what it actually feels like and is like to be an agentic, purposeful, skilled, productive person in the modern world and design around that. So I think there's a real need for us to get back to first principles and understand what is the relationship between, for example, learning on the one hand and development on the other. That's something we've never really addressed in schools. Our schools, especially for teenagers, are focused on you know, learning um, at the expense of the thing that's really pulling the cart, which is the young person's development as a thinker, as a social agent, as an identity self. And we need to think about what are the structures that we could design? What are the supports that are needed, not simply for the students and families, but also for the teachers and administrators in that building and for the community in which the school sits, such that we are setting up people, scaffolding people to be able to engage and build for themselves that sense of purpose and, uh, and to integrate expertise into that purposeful self. Um, the way that Jal had set up in the in the change. So we're uh, gonna. I promise that. you, all, we're, we are going to get to that. But first, I I want to I want to think about or talk a little more about like this moment in time. And and I don't want to. You know, you I've, I've 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 been around long enough to to understand that sometimes moments in time are are just excuses. Um, to do things, and sometimes they're real, and I, I, I think where we are right now is real. And the this is a real moment in time. Josh. Yeah, I mean, the feeling <laughs> that people have these days, I feel, is more. There, there's more opportunity for um, the kind of shifts that you're describing, and there's the real need 
for it. But I, and I know some people have been doing some things around that. And Saskia, it's kind of where, where I want to get to some of your work. I mean, you know, you've been bringing people together around thinking about what individualization should look like. You've been taught, you have examples of like how people have been doing some of the things that Jal described in his piece and that Mary Helen describes. So talk a little bit about like what you've learned in those communities and, and, and what you think some of the, maybe some of the, some of the promising practices, practices are that, that you've seen people engage in to tackle these issues. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, and I think I'm gonna answer by looping back to your very first question about the purpose Good. of education and then sort of winding my way there because I wanna vigorously agree with everything that the other three panelists has, have already put out on the table. And I think the framework that Jell has laid out and that Mary Helen has advanced in her response and even in this conversation is absolutely necessary if public education, and this is sort of a Carnegie lens, is going to fulfill its function as the foundation of our democracy. Like it, I don't think that that is up for debate. And I think one thing about this moment in time is that in some ways, I think the pandemic has propelled us into a greater collective understanding about how important some of these key pieces that Mary Helen was just describing are to not only learning, but to human thriving and to happiness and to joy. Um, so I, I think that there are some real opportunities in the, in the moment that we're in right now. But let me sort of reintroduce myself through the, the lens that you were just offering, Josh. Um, as you mentioned, my day job is at the Carnegie Corporation where for north of 20 years, we've been investing in new schools, particularly at the high school level that are pushing on some of the principles that Jal lays out. Um, but I, I also wanna call on two of my uh, recent extracurricular activities that I think are relevant today's, to today's conversation. One is my role convening a funder working group that's focused on the future of learning and school design, which I'm lucky enough to co-facilitate with Jen Holleran, who I think I saw is in the room and that GFE members are welcome to join us for that conversation where we have a diversity of funders who have different theories of change and levers that they're pulling on for how to advance this kind of a vision are in discussion together about what, the, what are the opportunities right now at this transformative moment for the education sector. And the second is my uh, recent term as chair of the Education Transition Committee for our new mayor and schools chancellor here in New York City. Uh, I mentioned both of these just because I think, um, certainly I, I will be responding this way, but I think all of the folks on this panel both through the lens of what philanthropy can do to advance the vision that John and Mary Helen have sketched for us, but also with a real pragmatic orientation about what it's going to take to manifest that, um, which is the part of the conversation where I think we have much less of a roadmap. And so let me just say, I love the examples that Jao offers in his article um, about what this can actually look like in practice. But I think we have to start the conversation by acknowledging that systemically we make it really difficult for folks to do this kind of work. Leaders and policymakers don't really have the stomach for the level of variation in practice that this kind of flexible thinking would produce. Um, funders and other decision makers don't have time horizons or project metrics that build out the kind of safe space that's necessary for this sort of change to play out and to take hold. Um, and teachers who I think are mostly really hungry to engage in this kind of pedagogy and this kind of student interaction, it wasn't part of their training um, doing working in this way. We don't have great models for in-service professional learning and we have no apparatus for knowledge sharing. Um, about how you could actually go about doing this work. So it's not easy for even a motivated educator to pull off this kind of a shift. Um, so I think that that is kind of, that's like the frame that we are up against in terms of making this a reality in the context of an incredibly diverse, massive, decentralized system in a way that any kid is equally likely to experience the sort of learning 
that Joe and Mary Helen have, have mapped for us. But let me just say one thing about the moment that we're in now to actually try to answer your question and the opportunity that I think it presents. I do think that there has been um, a shift in understanding that for those of us who have been doing this work for a really long time, like we never would have wanted these intersecting crises, the pandemic and our national reckoning with the history of white supremacy and racial injustice that defines our nation. Um, we, we never would have wanted those things to happen and to coincide. But the fact is that they, I think, have really forced, uh, uh, they've served as forcing mechanisms for a different way of thinking about you know, why kids are in school and what it means to learn and what the core ingredients are to that. Um, and I think like, we don't have to hypothesize actually because of the massive disruption to teaching and learning as we knew it about what happens when you remove some of the outmoded structures that Jal discusses in his article. Like See, time went out the window when schools had to transition overnight to remote instruction. It wasn't there anymore. And I think what many people saw and experienced in real time, whether they were teachers or whether they were talking about the learners themselves, or whether it was us parents who were overhearing our kids' classroom instruction that was happening over in the living room, um, you know, what we saw was the point that Mary Helen makes which is that like all you were left with were these core ingredients like motivation, curiosity, determination. It mattered much less whether a kid knew how to do a math problem and much more whether she wanted to do it. Um, and so I feel like some of, many of us have been out there sort of evangelizing about why we would need to do things differently. And I think one of the wins that we have at our back right now is that parents and learners and educators have really internalized the need for change based on what they've experienced. And then we get into reality, right? And the tractor beam of the status quo uh, and the question around how do you actually do this work? And, and there's so many different threads that like we could talk about this for hours, but I wanna kind of try to bring us so I'm also thinking about what, you know, and maybe because I, I, I have such blinders on because of my previous experience of like what you can actually do. And I think about, you know, whenever I go up to Brooklyn and I'm in New York and I talk to my friends who have kids and there's some of the small schools that have been seen are amazing. They're not, but not everyone is in them necessarily, in those amazing schools, but it's incredible the kind of learning kids are engaged in. And then down here in the DC area, every day in, in, there's something about um, the admissions at TJ right and and i and my kids going through the montgomery county system in a very kind of rigid and we're a superintendent of traditional comprehensive system which is more similar than new york city right so there's this question about if if we even if we disagree on what around the edges around what the purpose might be do we do we overthrow the social order or just sort of improve it do we tend to the pr kinds of practices that jaw describes and the kinds of things we're all seeing um, and, and some of the reasons why that Mary Helen describes are incredibly important. But then there's a the unit of change question. Where do you start chipping away so that in the 13,000 school districts or wherever else, and, and we can start pulling some levers to actually move adults towards some new, towards a new set of practices. So I'm curious as to, and please, any of you jump in and like, what's the right unit of change to start this work, which will be long-term work? Who, who wants to jump in on that? You know, I was just, I was going to, oh, go ahead, Jill. You go and then I'll go. We'll go in and then we'll go, Jill. Okay. I, you know, I was, I think Saskia is, it was starting um, to answer this question. So I want to, I want to build off of what she was um, really referring to and kind of has a lot of insight into, you know, I think a starting point is what we have learned here during the past two years with what uh, we have been through, not to mention, you know, so much of the learnings before that. But, you know, just a lens from, I think this, this after school and summer learning space, the experience over the past two years has been nothing short of transformational um, for the sector in the sense that uh, just like in any crisis, I think um, people banded together 
the, the educators, the mentors, the youth development, we saw a breaking down of silos that would have probably taken another 20 years. Um, and they did that because they just showed up to help kids, help families. You know, they were taking home assignments with meals. Um, they were dropping off um, different, you know, things families needed, basic necessities. Um, and there was an openness and a willingness to partner. So one, I guess one thought um, I would recommend for us thinking about in the future is, you know, we're already starting to see a retrenchment. In other words, okay, the crisis is over, right? So we're talking about the power of systems, right, Josh? This is, you know, I think what you're getting at. Uh, and as funders, we have an incredible responsibility to maintain a pressure on not, you know, this retrenchment that is so much a part of just systems and bureaucracies. Uh, but we're already seeing that. So during the pandemic, we saw um, best practices that, you know, in, in the thousands across the country, things like community learning hubs, where cities, you know, one of my favorites in Orlando, um, this, the county education department, the city got together, they created 17 community learning hubs for that had computer access, that had caring adults, some had after school, some did not. Um, you know, we saw these new models even starting to emerge in a very quick turnaround. You know, things that I think as funders, we, we try to get to have happen a lot faster. Um, but let's face it, it is very hard um, to kind of create these models and scale them in, in our current structures. Um, time in and time out, the data is showing from what we can see with after school programs and schools during this time, partnerships and relationships. Um, and I, I like to kind of say, you know, I'm, I'm a lawyer by training. Um, I'm not, you know, sort of looking for all of the um, relationships all of the time, uh, but it is undeniable. Uh, there, the, the relationship piece, the mentorship, the partnerships, um, from what the children are experiencing right up through the system, what the adults are experiencing. And to think that, you know, now we're gonna have um, in-school educators, okay, we're not, you know, now just do this again, all on your own. No, um, I, I, so I, I, would, I would offer that an important path forward and unit of change, again, using some of the different language, we need to start with where we're seeing promise in the system. That's at least one aspect. Um, and again, for funders uh, to really help do that at a rate that does not get overtaken by this, okay, we're just gonna go back because that is easier in some ways, or at least it feels easier in the moment. And people wanna go back to normal. Right where they're, you know, the yeah. So, Jal, you want to you you want to jump in on that too? I'm really glad that Gwen went uh, first because what I want to say builds directly off what she was just saying. Um, so, two thoughts. One, um, in a response to this sort of pessimism perspective, which I get sometimes, like you spend all this time in schools, like aren't you ready to like you know bash your head against the wall or? you know, throw yourself out the window, like you want, you know, much better, much different, like how do you live with the day to day? And I, I kind of fundamentally feel like that's a sort of a misreading that like, you know, maybe at one point earlier in my career, I thought there were kind of good schools and bad schools. And now I think it's like an Othello board, like there are sort of pockets of possibility pretty much everywhere. Like if, if we just like went from where any of us are sitting into like the closest school we could get into and we like asked around for particular teachers, programs, et cetera, we would find some things there where students feel known, where they find some purpose, where, you know, the teacher turned them on to something and it changed their life. Like we would find that everywhere. And so on the one hand, like I think we have a lot to build on. Um, in terms of the levers of change question, I think it's more about um, stance than like where you invest. Like if you took a sort of 
consistently future oriented stance and said like everything we're going to fund is going to be about creating purposeful activities for students, giving students choice and agency, allowing them to evaluate their work in a way that's authentic, um, that everything should be symmetrical and fractal. So if we want students to experience empowering known relationships, then their teachers can't be in schools where they're like overly, you know, controlled and so on and so forth. If we adopted that stance, like let's say we made a list of principles that are like, these are five principles of things that we stand for. Then I think we would find there's all kinds of opportunities. Like, could you support a state that's like trying to change it's like the nature of its assessments? Sure. Could you support a district that was trying to give schools more flexibility or create more, path, you know, linked learning college pathway um, type things or not college, but like, you know, linked learning kind of pathways, sure, should we submit a, should we support a school that's doing really innovative things as a place that could be a model? Are there, you know, connections between youth organizations and schools that could create kind of a more porous boundary between school and out of school? Uh, yes. So I kind of see this as kind of one large social movement with lots of different uh, tentacles and lots of different people having roles to play. And um, as people gradually experience the newer things, I can pretty much guarantee if we like rigorously evaluate them according to some meaningful metrics, they will show that they are, you know, doing good things for students and that will build more support. All right. So, so Mary Helen and Saskia, I'm going to try to put a question out there that builds on both what Gwyn and Jal said, and I'm going to try to make sense out of this. I, I was, I, I wanted to jump in, Gwyn, when you were talking, let's and keep the pressure on. So one question I have is who, what, what pressure should be applied? How should, how should philanthropists apl apply pressure and to whom, right? I think about policymakers and I think about the role of of current policies and structures that reinforce the rational order and efficiencies that drive schools, which we see in things like standardized testing, which we see in grade, um, age-based grade distribution, right? But particularly standardized testing, which sometimes I get obsessed with. But are there very, and, and that don't actually match with, you know, what the experience is that we want kids to have, um, and it doesn't match with best practices. So are there very particular policies, small p or big P, that schools are engaged in these, and systems are engaged in these days, um, that we need to put pressure on so that they are done away with, right? That, does that, first, does that question make sense? Or you'll answer the question you won't answer anyway, but I'm thinking about like way because this is this is a long term play, but we have to start today. So so what are some of the what are some of those pressure points that will enable us to get to where we, we want to get to is, is really the question I'm asking. And I, either one of you, Mary, Mary Helen or Saskia can please jump. In. All right, I'll start. Be the interrupt me, Saskia. Okay. Um, I mean, one thing I think is just so glaringly, you know, an elephant in the room um, is that people can't enact intentions when they don't deeply understand what those intentions are. So dismantling the structures um, and building structures that are conducive to different kinds of outcome measures, different kinds of uh, different kinds of supports, different kinds of aims is absolutely essential. But when people don't really have a deep understanding of the development and the learning they're trying to promote of the civic discourse and citizenship to, you know, dispositions that they're trying to promote in schools, then it's very difficult for them to aim at that. We end up deconstructing systems, but what do we replace it with? Some other system that you know, is well-intentioned, but when the individuals in the system don't really have a vision for what for what the learning should feel and look like and for the ways that people should engage with one another in school spaces then they're aiming into the dark and so i really think there's a need in parallel and maybe even uh, uh grant making around the intersection between these specifically um around the deconstruction and reconstruction of systems and 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 structures but in deeply informed by learning and sharing about 
the science of learning, about the science of development, and carrying out new science of learning development in these uh, in these systems that helps us understand things that are very new, and, uh, you know, that are kind of unique to this moment, but have been building up for time that we do not fully understand and that are absolutely fundamental, such as what's the role of media and digital learning and social media um, and information availability in the learning and development processes, right? What does it mean to have culturally responsive organizations, really, right? What does it mean um, to have social emotional wellness integrated with academic and scholarly achievement um, when you're preparing for the 21st century and not for the kinds of work that were around when schools were designed? So yeah, of course we can't wait for that science, but I think we need to invest in professional development that is co-constructed between the people in the systems and the individuals who are, um, who are kind of shedding light on the developmental and learning aspects of uh, what's happening in the system so that we can understand better what the aim should look like. So that means new kinds of professional development too. Josh, can I jump in? Then I want to. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm going to learn my lesson and go before Mary Helen next time because this is the second time it's happened and my brain has exploded and I don't know what to say. But um, let, just to the question of policies, I, I mean, I love this point that we need to know what it is that we, what are we designing toward in order to have policies that track toward the change that we're seeking to support. Um, and I think I'm a high school person, so I'll talk about this in the high school space. Um, you know, like if our belief, if our vision for teaching and learning is one where there is really applied learning that addresses real challenges, where you are not trying to guess the right answer, but you are confronting something new and novel and constructing the knowledge real time, then we need to have student assessments that track to that. We need to have graduation and completion requirements that recognize that, that celebrate you know, the uh, evidence of mastery rather than these sort of seat time accumulations. Um, and we need to have school accountability systems that you know, play out that same symmetry. And you know, there are opportunities for that. There's a pilot happening in New York State right now under our current chancellor, uh, our state chancellor, um, seeking to expand the performance consortium of high schools that have a waiver from regents requirements. It's something that Carnegie has supported um, and seeking to promote that kind of innovation in schools other than those that have to date been able to pull off that kind of performance-based assessment structure, which tend to serve more affluent communities and kids, even though they're public schools. And so I think there's a real push to look um, to support the folks who are most proximate to the problem, to the challenge, folks in schools to, to innovate themselves and develop solutions that respond to their unique context based on some of the promising practices that already exist. And then I just, this is not totally an answer to the question, but I just want to loop back to something you said earlier, Josh, about walking into, if you go into any school and you ask like, you know, who's the, who's the adult who changed your life or who is it that you go to when you have a problem, they will point you in the direction of somebody. There is always like a kernel there. Um, sorry, John, maybe you're the one who said that, but whoever deserves the attribution. Um, that's a total pro tip as is my favorite, which is if you really wanna know what's going on in any school building, ask the school custodian. Um, but I will, I think that there is an analog to that system-wide if what we're seeking to do right now in this moment of really limited resources, exhausted educators, et cetera, et cetera, our orientation or our stance is to build on what works and build on what we're learning. At the school level, there are schools that are innovating and we don't have to divine who those schools are. All you have to do, it turns out, is ask other schools and ask other educators. So one of the projects that we funded at Carnegie um, is called the Canopy Project. It was initiated over at the Christensen Institute. It's now housed at Transcend. Um, and that through that project, we crowdsourced across schools and leading education innovators, like 
who do you look to? What are school level examples of what innovative practice looks like? And there's this tremendous public database that anybody can access that is organized, classified by the different practices that these schools have leaned into as the starting point for their change agendas. Um, so it, there are ways into this. There are portals that we can sort of put ourselves through if we want to start on a path that builds on what we know. All right. So, so and I, I know we don't have much time, but I want to try to pull a couple of pieces together for a short answer. Um, I'm thinking about Mary Helen, what you said about vision, and you were kind of going down a road, I think, in some ways, and and I think. Saskia, you were addressing this too. In my mind, it, it's really about community vision, right? And to the point where families and um, students and teachers, those who are closest to the problems, should be solving the problems, are, are really coalescing around a vision. And we know that a couple of dynamics are happening right now. People are exhausted, right? They don't have the tolerance for it. And it's becoming more and more dangerous, like literally dangerous for superintendents, for school board members, for principals, for teachers to speak out of, you know, gosh, they can't make people feel uncomfortable by discussing history. I mean, that's real in ways I've never seen before. So this is a group of funders. This is a group of philanthropists. This is a group who want to see us organizing towards a collective vision. I guess I'll go back to the starting point. Um, you know, where, what's the first thing that we should support people in schools doing differently so that we are organizing towards a collective a different collective vision that gets more to what we've been talking about right what what is that thing people are you know all said that people can do differently tomorrow that that we can put some money behind to say yeah there is a different there is a different way and and Try to try to keep it short because I know we're running short of time. So what's what's the one thing? I mean, there are no silver silver bullets, but what would you like to see? Um, one from... one thing. I mean, it's going to take a lot to do it. Change assessment. Assessment. Yeah, yeah. Right. change assessment. Work more around like these performance based consortium assessment models, right? Which mm -hmm. implies all kinds of different skills and knowledge on the part of the adults in the building to be able to assess in those ways. They need to deeply understand what they're looking for in youth's development and, and supporting process rather than endpoint. Um, but if you change assessment, that's a great way to start. Because so long as the assessments, and I'm not the first person to say this by any means, so long as the assessments are the means by which people get currency out of the work that they do, we're going to teach to them. And those assessments um, you know, uh, imply a kind of teaching and learning process, yep. which is deeply transactional and not, uh, not human developmentally, you know, not humanistic. And maybe by creating the demand for new assessments, the policies will follow, right? Yeah. I'll go Saskia, then I'll go Gwen, then I'll go Jaws. So that's the one thing we heard assessments. What, what, what do you think? Yeah, I think because I think there is a different answer for every school building and for every district, I would just say start with student voice. If we center the student experience, mm -hmm. they will tell us what we need to work on first and that's a way to prioritize across the many different things that interesting we both those things were on the demand side of the equation right you're actually creating that interesting okay gwen what do you think well i get a plus one on both of those so i don't actually have to pick one <laughs> so novel I'm ideas cheating. only novel I, ideas. <laughs> um, I i think that we have to support our educators to create the kinds of programs that they need to help their students. Um, they know uh, in, in many cases, and Tony in the chat was pushing on this purpose of school. Um, I think to get there, we've got to allow our educators to work in partnership with those who can help support them, especially right now. Yeah, that may just be buying time, right? I mean, we need to create the time and space in some ways, yeah, yeah. John, what do you think? Um, well, plus one, obviously, to all of those. Uh, one one thing might be to um, to slow down. Mm. Um, I think we could use like a, a slow education movement to go with like the slow food movement. Um, and so uh, what I mean by that is, um, especially in middle schools and high schools, everything is characterized by sort of constant rush. Like students from period to period, teachers told us in our study that like 45 minutes was just long enough to launch something 
and get people going on it when it was time to wrap it up. Um, teachers told us they had no time to collaborate by international standards. Our high school teachers teach 1100 hours and high school teachers in Japan teach like 550 hours. Um, so we could create like time, we could create significantly more time. Um, Ron Berger has a story about this, about his parents going on a uh, European tour and seeing like 14 countries in 17 days and coming back and showing him the pictures. And he was like, what is this? And then they were like, I'm not sure what it was and what country it was in. Like, I feel like our high school education kind of looks like that. So were we to, and I, almost everything good we found was, you know, an after school production where they worked for eight weeks on like one play or a project or a problem or a looping situation where they stayed with the same teacher for several years or almost everything we found that was good. There was a teacher who said, um, uh, some of my kids got interested in the fact that uh, this is a teacher in the Bronx and his kids were mostly black and Latinx. And he said, you know, my kids got interested early in the year in the fact that the slavehold, that the um, founding fathers like owned slaves. And he's like, you know, when I was a younger teacher, I would have been like, that's interesting, but we need to move on. And he's like, as a more experienced teacher, I was like, wait a minute, like we've got kids who are like interested in a really critical issue in American history. Like, let's take some time to explore that. Yeah, so slow down. I, I couldn't agree more. Just a very quick story. And I wrote a piece about this. When I first became superintendent in Montgomery County, I made all my executive team and myself, we, we shadowed a kid for a day. Um, and it had to be, you know, an average kind of kid. And I still remember my experience with David. I was exhausted. And not only was I exhausted physically, but I could not get over mentally how the kid I was with, every 45 minutes you had to switch and there's the emotional switch of oh wait maybe i don't like this teacher or oh wait maybe this kid in the class i don't like or you know whatever there's the emotional and then there's the intellectual one oh i'm going from science to math to whatever makes no sense 180 days a year seven and a half hours a day well high school actually is more like 150 um but it's it's exhausting and it's not good for kids right in in so many ways so so i guess you know and, and tony asked the question in the chat that i want to see if we can kind of maybe get back to it. I tried to get at it a little bit, um, but the, I, I guess maybe the way I want to ask this is that we are to a certain extent, a little bit of a bubble, right? In terms of how we think about things and how we think about it all the time. And we think about what the purpose should be or could be and what a new social order could look like. Um, uh, but then we have the realities out there and, and how, I don't know if the word is hopeful I'm looking for, but but how do we start organizing towards a, what could be a new purpose given the incredibly divisive politics and, and the limited imagination that many parents have about what school should be as we see in the TJ fights, right? Or the Stuyvesant fights, right? Um, given limited imagination, given you know the, the politics, how can we organize towards a new purpose of schools? And what's the role of philanthropists in that? Short answers only. I would just jump in to maybe build on the youth voice piece mm, yes. and youth leadership, because I think what we can see there is it's a very powerful way of organizing that speaks to motivation for kids. I mean, and young kids too, not just middle and high school, and also for the grownups. Um, you know, it's not, it's not this, it's not a silver bullet, Josh, as you know, you pointed out, we don't have that. Uh, but we're seeing a lot of promise there. I mean, I, and I think with everything that young people are experiencing today through the pandemic and this um, reckoning around the need for equity, uh, there really are some very promising aspects to having not just youth voice, but youth leading and developing their programs and their opportunities. Got it, other thoughts? I mean, I think you're raising a really critical issue. Uh, like a good moderator, you picked on like the most controversial thing I said and sort of centered it, uh, but like remaking the social order. But I, I think um, Ron Berger, who's done a lot of work uh, in the South and across a variety of states, says that like he starts all his presentations with like 
adults will be judged by like the quality of their work and the quality of their character. And so like, let's talk about what those two things look like to you. Like what does quality work look like? What does quality character look like? And he says, you know, look, like we might disagree on abortion, death penalty, like a variety of things, but I bet we agree on like empathy, responsibility, follow through, um, producing quality work, doing what you say you'll do, et cetera. And so I, I, I think if you, if you Google portrait of a graduate, like in theory, like every community is like developing their own portrait of a graduate, but in practice, like they kind of all look pretty similar. Yep. Um, so I, I, I think it's important to engage uh, families in a concrete way of thinking about like, what do they want for their young people? And I think if you do that, in a, like no matter how it comes out, like it will be more sort of human centered, like around what we actually want for young people than like mitochondria, French Indian war, et cetera. Like no one's gonna pick those things. And, and what do adults need to know and be able to do in order to give that to young people is the corollary to that. Other, other thoughts about, uh, about that before we go to the last speed round question that I have for everyone. Um, so one way to think about this, just to jump in, which is, is, is that it's very consistent with the neuroscience. I've stuck a couple things in the chat if people want. But, but the idea that our educational theories of learning are focused on um, uh, semantic memory, right, knowing stuff, and on procedural memory, which is being able to do stuff. But the key glue developmentally in the brain that holds memory together is episodic memory. It's the memory for experience. So if we started to attend to the memory for experience, what kinds of memories are people here building out of this experience? That's a simple way to basically honor voice, come back to the core values that we care about, right? And build learning at the same time. So thinking about it that way. Saskia, any thoughts? I refuse to go after Mary Helen again. I'm gonna come back at your lightning round. Okay. <laughs> Then let's start with the lightning round and we'll go, we'll, we'll, we'll start with you, Saskia. So 25 words or less, right? What's the most hopeful or joyous thing that you have seen uh, in, in schools uh, recently? Uh, the best news that I had recently was when I was calling up one of the youth co-chairs for our education transition committee to get her to come to a big speech because the point she had made so unassailably and convincingly was being incorporated into the chancellor's remarks. And she said to me, I can't, I'm not in New York because I'm doing a congressional internship. So I think the kids are gonna take the day. Awesome, Mary Helen. I would say, I think I've been extremely heartened by the number of, of students who've invited me to speak at their schools over the past six months and over the summer. They are very, very keen to understand their own selves and to take control over their own development and to leverage school structures and build them out the way they need. And that I find really exciting. Gwen. There's been an amazing set of partnerships with schools and communities. And so here's a quote from a young woman who is uh, a high school student. The most meaningful part of my after school program is the sense of community and family that I feel inside the program. Sometimes a child doesn't have that example at home in a family and feels alone and isolated. I can relate to that. When I went to my after school program, it was the experience of family and community, and I appreciate that. And I think that's not just an after school, that's what educators have done. And that's what we have to continue to kind of innovate to do. Yep, yep, John. Uh, I put it in the chat. It's this video that um, Expeditionary Learning made uh, of their students during the pan, like it was made during the pandemic, and it was students singing a song together that they composed and wrote like across many different Zoom screens, beautifully like choreographed and uh, fitting together, just sort of like spectacular, like what young people can do. What, what I love about this conversation, and I thank you all so much for it, is that there's very like high level, complex, really thoughtful ways or considerations that we need to make about what we should be doing. And what we keep coming back to is like, talk to kids, right? Hear about their experiences. Listen to what they have to say about what they're experiencing every day, what they want, 
how they can learn, grow and get better. And maybe if we start with that sort of smallest unit, right, and build from there, that, that might be a path forward. So um, I'll turn it back over to Olka, but again, I just appreciate everyone participating in this, reading our pieces, all the back and forth online, um, on Cap and Online, as well as here, and it's great to be a part of it. And so um, thank you all for, for being on the panel today, and I will turn it back over to Olka. Thank you. Thank you, Josh, for your great moderation as always. Thank you, Gwen, um, Mary Helen, Chal, and Saskia for a really wonderful conversation. For those of you who are here, um, you can go back to the recording on our website at any point if you want to go back over this conversation as well as past conversations in the series. A couple of upcoming programs on April 5th, we have our out of school time uh, funder meetup. We have a funder to funder discussion on community college grant making on April 12th. And the next in this series, new considerations around educational assessment will be on April 13th. Thank you all for joining us and have a great day.